very rowdy crowd, the uh, Rossetti's lot. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, someone said to me, I've never been at to such a noisy conference, which, again, I think is, is, a, is a wonderful thing, is, is telling of the, the generative uh, atmosphere of, uh, of, this, of this topic. So, um, as I mentioned to you before, my uh, colleague Shreya Chatterjee is unwell, so you have me off the subs bench to chair um, this session on relationships. And I think, again, when we were conceiving of the conference, our titles were uh, purposefully broad to be able to gather different perspectives and together and, and research from um, different positions and I think the relationships question uh, came up in the last panel in really uh, provocative and suggestive ways of thinking about obviously um, relationship familial relationships or love relationships but I was thinking it's very um, suggestive to think of intergenerational relationships as well and we were talked about past and present um, the, the historic and, and the future and also I think the relationship between writing and the artwork was coming through so I think in this next session as well we're going to explore this from many different angles and we're going to follow the same format of having our three uh, papers together for about 15 minutes and then we'll open that up into a panel discussion and question and answer session um, with you all so so, um, I'm going to follow Liz's lead and say if you would like to know more about our speakers please read their biographies um, on the website which is on the Paul Mellon website and um, you'll find all that information there so our first speaker is Glenda Yud from the University of York who will give a paper entitled a complex relationship Gabrielle Christina and Elizabeth Rossetti welcome to you Glenda Thank you, and uh, it's lovely to be here with a, ha a hall full of people. Um, the last time I actually spoke to such a large group was in 2019, December, just before everything kicked off. So I'm delighted that we're all back together again. The relationship that I'm going to talk about this today is um, the relationship between Gabriel, Christina and Elizabeth Rossetti. Now, not a lot has been written about the relationship between the three of them. So I've had a trawl through what does exist, and I'm just going to present to you what I found. So those that we're talking about. Gabriel was the eldest of four children. As a boy, he was lucky. He attended school and art school. Christina, his younger sister, was home educated. Obviously, she was a girl. Elizabeth was the second oldest daughter of a much larger family, but she was also home educated. But one thing that they had in common from the start, they all had a love of poetry from an early age. The Rossetti family read Dante, and Elizabeth is said to have found Tennyson on a paper wrapped around a pat of butter. So let's start at the beginning with the brotherhood. Gabriel and Christina were an integral part of the Brotherhood from its inception. Christina, in effect, was an honorary brother. As Gabriel's sister, she was the natural choice as a model for the early Pre-Raphaelite paintings. She participated on equal terms with her male colleagues, demonstrating an ambition that was way beyond that of a traditional Victorian woman. Then the situation changed. Enter Elizabeth. Now, there are many stories about her entry into the pre-Raphaelite circle. Probably the most familiar one is that she was found in a bonnet shop by Walter Deverell. But it's much more likely that it was as a dressmaker to Mrs. Deverell. She then posed for Walter's, Walter Deverell's uh, painting Twelfth Night, several works by Holman Hunt, and Millet's Ophelia. William Michael Rossetti suggests that Rosso Vestita was the first color, a watercolor for which Elizabeth sat to Gabriel. But the exact date that Christina learned of Gabriel's new model and his infatuation with her was unknown. William believed that they were engaged by the end of 1851, but if that was really the case, then surely Christina would have known of her existence. But there's no evidence for that at all. 
Elizabeth was an aspiring artist, and after Ophelia, she became Gabriel's pupil. She produced drawings and watercolours from her own ideas, but followed the pre raphaelite style and ethic, illustrating some of the same subjects as her male colleagues, such as Tennyson's Lady of Shalott. She still sat for Gabriel, but her focus was on her own artistic production. She targeted the blossoming market for book illustration and worked alongside Gabriel. But at this stage, the unity of the Brotherhood was shattered. Woolner had left for Australia, Collinson had rejected the group and gone back to the Catholic faith, and Gabriel had become totally obsessed with Elizabeth. But Christina also drew and painted. This portrait of her brother William shows a marked similarity with the drawing that Gabriel made for Woolner when he went to Australia. The necktie and the jacket lapel, lapels appear identical, as if both portraits were drawn from the model at the same time. Although she's sketched from a different angle and her drawing is technically inferior to Gabriel's, Christina's drawing offers evidence that she too had absorbed the early pre-Raphaelite outline style. She had an acute eye, to, eye for detail, and that was present in her poetic language. This shows a drawing that is clearly identifiable as William, with each hair on his head individually defined. Christina's first love, though, was language and poetry. She felt her art was discouraged by criticism, and it was inferior. Gabriel had warned Christina not to rival Elizabeth in the first letter that he wrote to her of 1852. Now, in this letter, Gabriel refers to, Christi to Elizabeth as his beloved, that dear, that love, and a meek, unconscious dove. Now, surely those words must have invoked some jealousy on Christina's part. Christina appears to have been sidelined, even replaced as his brother's model and confidant. Her position as the only pre-Raphaelite sister has been usurped by that red-haired newcomer that she had not even met. That letter would probably have wounded Christina emotionally, especially as it followed the breakdown of her relationship and her engagement to James Collinson. Gabriel finally introduced Christina to Elizabeth in March 1854. And it's possible that a poem by Christina gives her first impressions of Elizabeth. Now, due to time, I'm only going to get a chance to read a short amount. But in the first three stanzas, Christina embellishes Gabriel's use of the word dove as a term of endearment for Elizabeth. She listened like a Kushat dove that listens to its mate alone. She listened like a Kushat dove that loves but only one. And then... The poem, as it's normally produced, concludes, her pulses fluttered like a dove to hear him speak. But that's only part of the story. When that poem was published in 1896, after Christina's death, it was published with the, the title Listening, and it was severely edited by William to omit the last two stanzas because he thought they appear to represent her less well. So editing these last two stanzas erases Christina's true feelings. Her title for the poem was Choices, which the last two stanzas reflect. And this is what the last two stanzas say. He chose what I had feared to choose. Ah, which was wiser, I or he? He chose a love-worn, priceless heart. I chose a cold, bare dignity. He chose a life like stainless spring that buds to summer's perfect glow. I chose a tedious dignity as cold, as cold as snow. He chose a garden of delights where still refreshing waters flow. I chose a barren wilderness whose bud died years ago. I think her jealousy and her regret and her sorrow at her own decision in, is cut steeply and is visible in that poem. 
And, of course, Gabriel was incessantly drawing Elizabeth. She finally met the Rossetti family in 1855, just after gaining Rossetti's patronage. But it appears that it was a difficult meeting. Shortly afterwards, Ford Maddox Brown revealed in his diary a certain coldness between Christina and Gabriel, because she and Guggams do not agree. Gabriel was drawing, as I said, and painting Elizabeth incessantly. So was Christina jealous of Elizabeth, of her success with Ruskin? Unfortunately, there are no record of any of Elizabeth's thoughts on her first meeting with Christina. Now, Christina is known to have had a fiery temper. She was prone to exploding in fits of rage. This sketch by Gabriel depicts his sister in the throes of a tantrum, leaping in the air, wildly maving, waving a mallet around. The scene is of utter destruction. The window panes and mirror are cracked, curtain torn, a table and chairs broken. The coils and the cogs from the mantel clock spill out towards us. Now, was the rage visible in her poetry? Well, In an Artist's Studio is a very familiar poem, generally read as the artist in love with his model. But let's turn that around. Christina wrote the poem. Maybe her first visit to Gabriel's studio, confronted by this sea of drawings, would have put a different spin on this. Excuse me while I jump down. One face looks out from all his canvases. One self-same figure <laughs> sits or walks <laughs> or leans. We found her hidden just behind those screens. That mirror throws back all her loveliness. A queen in opal or in ruby dress. A nameless girl in freshest summer greens. Thank you. <laughs> the poem actually concludes, not as she is, but was when hope shone bright. Not as she is, but as she fills his dream. But the hope, whose hope was shining bright? Was it not perhaps Christina's hope of friendship with Elizabeth, which didn't materialize? Perhaps the tones of irritation, anger, or jealousy can be read into that poem instead of the lovey-dovey way it's normally read. And Christina doesn't like the fact that Elizabeth has replaced her in Gabriel's life. So we come to the wedding. <laughs> Gabriel was always held as a procrastinator. But did Elizabeth value her independence? Did the family friction play a role in the delay of the wedding? The first Christina knew of the wedding at all was in, indirectly. Gabriel wrote to his mother in May 1860, just before the event. My dear mother, I write you this word to say that Lizzie and I are going to be married at last in as few days as possible. But as we know, no family attended, just two witnesses. Christina's displeasure at being excluded from the wedding was evident in a letter that she wrote to Lady Trevelyan later in 1860. His marriage would have been of more satisfaction to us if we had seen his bride. But family gatherings eventually did take place and the relationship improved. In February 1861, Christina wrote to a friend, Mary Hayden, my sister-in-law proves an acquisition now that we know her better. This suggests that perhaps several meetings had taken place by this time and the atmosphere between all three had become more relaxed. But by this time, 
Elizabeth would have been about six months pregnant. Christina was about to become an aunt, and the imminent arrival of the new baby may have had a mellowing effect on the relationship between the three. Sadly, the baby daughter was stillborn in the late spring of 1861. Gabriel wrote to his, inform his mother on the 2nd of May, Lizzie has just been delivered of a dead child. He reveals no emotion at all in his words. But Christina has written several poems included in Sing Song, which perhaps recall her grief at the loss of her stillborn niece. So I'll just write, read a little. Baby lies so fast asleep that we cannot wake her. Will the angels clad in white fly from heaven to take her? Now, Sing Song itself was published as a collection of rhymes dedicated without permission to the baby who suggested them. And William Michael says that that baby was identified as the son of Arthur Cayley, who was the brother of Christina's other former suitor, Charles Cayley. But the baby in the poems is clearly a female, which suggests it may be Elizabeth's stillborn daughter. We have no record of Elizabeth's feelings on loss or how deeply it affected her mental health. But George Arnaburn Jones describes witnessing Elizabeth rocking the empty cradle. We found her sitting on a low chair with the childless cradle on the floor beside her. She cried with a soft, kind of soft wildness when we came in. Hush, Ned, you'll waken it. The blossoming relationship ended abruptly on the 11th of February in 1862, when Elizabeth died from a laudanum overdose. Christina offered to include a selection of Elizabeth's poems in tribute in her volume, The Prince's Progress and Other Poems, which was published several years after Elizabeth's death. In a letter to Gabriel in February 1865, she wrote, I wonder if possibly you might ever see fit to let some of dear Lizzie ver Lizzie's verses come out in a volume of mine, distinguished, I need not say, as hers. Such a combination would be very dear to me. But however, on reading Elizabeth's poetry, Christina declared, how full of beauty they are, but how painful. How they bring poor Lizzie herself before one with her voice, face, and manner. However, Lizzie's poetry, or Elizabeth's poetry, has a lot of parallels with some of Christina's. For example, Christina's Love Lies Bleeding and Elizabeth's Dead Love all look at the theory of um, unrequited love, love that's died, love that's gone bad, but there's no time to elaborate further on those. The project didn't materialise, but her words suggest that her posthumous memories of Elizabeth were kind and loving. There's no rivalry or jealousy mentioned at all. The Prince's Progress eventually did become a collaboration. Christina, Christina chose Elizabeth Watercolour St Agnes Eve as her favourite memento, and the design idea from Elizabeth St, Agri uh, St Agnes Eve was used by Gabriel to illustrate the title page of Prince's Progress. Gabriel himself remembered Elizabeth in both poetry and painting. The portrait perhaps reflects what we see in the painting. This is her picture as she was. It seems a thing to wonder on, as though mine image in the glass should tarry when myself am gone. I gaze until she seems to stir, until mine eyes almost aver that now, even now, the sleep, sweet lips part to breathe the words of the sweetheart, and yet the earth is over her. He's obviously still obsessed with Elizabeth, and perhaps showing some signs of regret. All three Rossettis were ambitious for success in the sister arts of poetry and painting, yet none achieved it during their own lifetime. They had a complex relationship with success, as well as with each other. Christina painted with words. Words provided Elizabeth with her inspiration for art, and Elizabeth was Gabriel's inspiration. Gabriel admired both Christina 
and Elizabeth. Christina became one of the greatest poets of the Victorian era. Her poems are well known. Remember is frequently recited at funeral services. And A Christmas Carol, which we know as In the Bleak Midwinter, was set to music by Gustav Holtz and is a Christmas favourite. Conversely, her art is basically forgotten in private collections or in archives. Elizabeth still lives on in Millet's painting, Ophelia, still on the walls of the gallery in the Tate and one of the most popular artworks. Consequently, she's still remembered mostly as a model and muse. But this exhibition shows her as an artist and as an inspiration and is helping to regain her rightful place in the pre-Raphaelite circle. Gabriel achieved overwhelming posthumous success as an artist, less so as a poet. His paintings are now highly regarded and extremely valuable. And in death, Christina and Elizabeth lie in peace together in the Rossetti grave in Highgate Cemetery. And that remains one of the most popular with visitors. Gabriel decided he didn't want to go to the family grave and he's buried at Birchington on Sea, Essex. However difficult their relationship in life, with perhaps ambition and rivalry impeding the development of a close relationship, the three people close to the heart of the Pre-Raphaelite circle are now forever united in death and in this exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, for that uh, wonderful performance, but also really moving um, paper. Um, our next uh, speaker is also a catalogue author, and I really recommend picking up a, a copy of the catalogue for this exhibition and reading the really fantastic new research contained in it. Um, Wendy Parkins is going to give a, a paper entitled I Never Quite Gave Myself, Pre-Raphaelite Women and Gifts of Creative Exchange. Welcome, Wendy. This conference invites us to challenge the myth of the artist as a self-contained individual and stresses the relationality between creative men and women closely associated with Dante Gabriel Rossetti. In this vein, I begin with what Marion Milner has called the paradox of creativity, the way it both relies on and seeks to transcend the space between self and other. Like the pre-Raphaelite women, Marion Milner found that her own experiments with creativity were constrained by marriage and motherhood, and with tensions between professional recognition and self-expression. However, as a psychoanalyst associated with the independent or middle group, which included D.W. Winnicott, Milner approached creativity within the framework of object relations theory in her book, on not being able to paint, first published in 1950. There, she posited that the relationship of oneself to the external world is basically and originally a relationship of one person to another, even though it does eventually become differentiated into relations to living beings and relations to things, inanimate nature. Looked at in these terms, the problem of the relation between the painter and her world becomes basically a problem of one's own need and the needs of the other. A problem of reciprocity between you and me. Experimenting both with free drawing and with different media such as pencil and chalk, as well as painting, Milner hoped to find a way to accommodate an openness to the external world with an attention to the subjective inner world. Milner concluded that the very mixed results, if not outright failures, of bringing together her intentions to capture inner experience, her rudimentary skills, and sometimes recalcitrant materials, was in fact the point. The object, the artwork, is, she wrote, endowed with a bit of the me, the inner experience. 
while at the same time the irreducible otherness of the material or medium remains present. Such failures, Milner speculated, might become the basis for a better understanding of the equal claims to recognition of self and other, the inner and external worlds, necessary for psychic health and an enhanced mode of living. For Milner then, the paradox of creativity is that as a process that negotiates the space between self and other in its widest sense, it holds open the possibility of bridging that space, bringing about a closer relationship between self and other, even as it also offers a unique opportunity to foreground the self in a particularly powerful or revealing way. If for Milner, art or creativity is always relational, it can also be thought of as a gift in at least two ways. A gift to the self, because it allows insight not otherwise available, with the resulting knowledge making possible a revitalised experience of life. And a gift shared with and communicated to others, as a material rendering of a unique imaginative vision um, that did not previously exist. Thinking of gifts and creativity in this way may well remind us of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, where generosity and friendship, but also rivalry and reciprocity, collaboration and obligation were much in evidence. A comprehensive study of gift giving in Pre-Raphaelite circles would need to include a lengthy catalogue of gifts exchanged for starters, think of the wedding gifts associated with Red House. As well as less tangible forms of exchange in the form of mentoring, skill sharing, the lending and borrowing of props and materials, the sharing of artists, models, contacts and patrons, and various other kinds of collaborations and partnerships that existed from the formation of the PRB and then Morris, Marshall, Faulkner and Co, to the cooperative principles underpinning the arts and crafts movement. Such a catalogue of gifts might well include the macabre, like Rossetti's book of poems buried with Elizabeth Siddle, described by his biogra biographer, William Sharp, as Rossetti's last gift to his dead wife, as well as the more ordinary gift of hospitality that so many contemporaries described receiving in the home of Jane and William Morris, first at Red House and later at Kelmscott Manor. Within pre-Raphaelite networks of collaboration and creative experimentation, as many have noted, there was an unusual degree of reciprocity and inclusivity, with the Morris's Red House serving as a particularly significant example. However, even here, there was not an equivalence between the experiences, practices, and outcomes available to men and women, as accounts such as that by Georgiana Byrne-Jones made clear, with pregnancy and motherhood gradually sidelining the women from fuller collaboration, while the men pursued professional and commercial opportunities beyond the domestic frame. A further dimension relevant to understanding relationality and creativity among pre-Raphaelite women, however, came from the wider Victorian culture and its practices of domestic handicrafts and gift giving. Talia Schaffer has argued that by mid-century, domestic handicrafts were coded as specifically women's hobbies that blurred labor and leisure in the middle class home. Further, the craft was supposed to be a uniquely personal expression of a strong domestic attachment to bear the individual marks of the producer's particular taste, inventiveness and skill, and to be given as an inalienable testimonial to their relationship. If we also recall Jill Rappaport's argument in giving women that, quote, gift giving, gift giving provides a crucial lens for seeing how Victorian middle class women redefined the primary allegiances of their everyday lives. Then the artworks and craft objects of women such as Jane Morris and Elizabeth Siddle, as women of working class origin, become more challenging to unravel, being overdetermined by a number of factors, 
such as the explicit principles of pre-Raphaelite production, domestic ideology concerning labour and gender, and also Victorian sentimentality, which influenced how handcrafted gifts expressed and encoded emotional attachments. With all this in mind then, I want to consider briefly and very speculatively a few examples of creative exchange between pre-Raphaelite women as instances where the expression of self was also an expression of connection to the other given material form. Firstly, the jewellery casket, usually presumed to be given to Jane Morris as a wedding present by Elizabeth Siddle and Gabriel, and which is in keeping with the style and theme of other pieces that were part of the decoration of Red House, such as the wardrobe that was a wedding gift from Edward Byrne Jones. It appears in May Morris's will, described as painted by DGR and Mrs Rossetti, so it had remained in the family. What we know of the friendship between Elizabeth and Jane remains sketchy, but we see Jane Morris and Elizabeth Siddle together without the presence of their husbands in visiting Georgiana Byrne Jones, for instance, and Elizabeth stays at Red House without Gabriel. So we can assume a bond between the two women that was not simply due to their respective connection with Rossetti. Siddle is most often spoken of as the main hand in the box's decoration, and this would be consistent with the recent discovery of the bedroom murals at Red House, at least partly attributed to Siddle. While the choice of the figures and scenes depicted by Siddle were most likely the result of collaboration and consultation with others, um, the connection between Elizabeth and Jane in this jewellery case warrants further consideration because it gives material form to an exchange grounded in female friendship, even if the full extent of the relation between maker and recipient still eludes us to some degree. My second example provides another instance of friendship and creativity as an expression of a reciprocity between you and me in the manner that Marion Milner outlined. Marie Spitali Stillman, described by May Morris as her mother's nearest friend, painted several pictures of Kelmscott, a place she visited regularly at Jane Morris's invitation. Spitali Stillman expressed in her letters not only her gratitude for Jane Morris's hospitality at Kelmscott, but the tranquil respite it provided her from challenging family demands. It is believed that Spitali Stillman may have given at least one of her Kelmscott pictures to Jane Morris. And more recently, it has been speculated that Spitali Stillman was influenced by Morris's embroidery in works she produced dating from after her time spent at Kelmscott, which could suggest even closer forms of creative exchange between the two women. And the garment on the left um, was embroidered by um, Spitali Stillman. And many of you will recognize the, the bag on the right, which was Jane Morris's work. One reason why I read the Count and Scott paintings as a gesture of relationship is their tendency to focus on the more domestic aspects of the house. Mostly from the back of the buildings, like the kitchen yard, which is the working part of the house, as well as the, oh, sorry, I've gone too far, um, as well as the flower gardens that meant so much to Jane Morris, who was a keen gardener, as her letters to Philip Webb make clear. Although exterior, these are intimate spaces in some ways and um, were known intimately by both the artist and her hostess. My final example is a more straightforward gift with a clear provenance. A modest keepsake book made by Jane Morris and given to Rosalind Howard. The opening page is inscribed on Nelia 1878 referring to a holiday that Jane Morris spent with the Howards in Italy, and perhaps suggesting that the book was made there. Like all of the four keepsake books by, made by Jane Morris still in existence, it combines textual ex excerpts with, uh, from a range of sources akin to a commonplace book. With their combination of image and text, binding and cover decoration, 
These books bear out Schaffer's delineation of the domestic handicraft, testifying to the maker's taste and skill, as well as to the importance of the relationship with the gift's recipient, warranting the investment of time, care and creativity. As with the jewellery casket, the continued ownership of the Howard Keepsake book over time attests in turn to the affection invested in the object and its maker by the recipient. From this material gift made by Jane Morris, I turn to a more controversial instance to conclude. In his diary, Wilfred Blunt reported Jane Morris telling him that, I never quite gave myself as I do now. In the context of Blunt's affair with Jane Morris, an affair in which the memory of Gabriel loomed large, at least from um, judging from Blunt's diary account, it seems to be a statement with a clear sexual dimension. But in the context of my argument here, it is the form of words that Blunt attributed to Jane Morris that I find particularly interesting. A woman in Jane Morris's position may be said to have given herself in any number of ways, in marriage to William, in her work as an artist model, as a mother, as a hostess, as a friend. For a woman to give herself then opens up a range of divergent, a divergent, sorry, if not contradictory possibilities. Does it mean giving a part of or a token of the self? Does it mean a gift of one's time, attention, affection? Or does it mean self-abnegation, giving at cost to the self? Does it signify agency or its absence? Such a statement also has a performative dimension. In not quite giving herself before, the self remains present and available, able to be given, consenting to be given, both giver and gift. What if we were to think of the creative projects by pre-Raphaelite women in a somewhat similar way, as a giving of self with deliberation and intention, perhaps even with love to another, as simultaneously a gift and a declaration of worthiness by the self who gives? In Marion Milner's exploration of the challenges she faced, both artistic and existential, in trying to paint, she concluded that the problem is not only that of finding a way of giving inner subjective reality an outer form, but of coming to believe that the outside world wants what one has to give. The artist's position in any society may be precarious, but for women in particular to make and to make available what is made was far more difficult at a time when women were often defined as both the embodiment of self-sacrifice and available for sexual exchange. In their gifts of self-expression, pre-Raphaelite women perhaps found a vital way to encourage in each other a belief that the outside world wanted what they each had to give. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wendy, and some really wonderful images there. I felt like we were walking with you through those, uh, those gardens and those places of uh, friendship and exchange. Our last paper in this trio is Jennifer Rabideau, who's a doctoral candidate at Cornell University. And her paper is entitled Pre-Raphaelite Women in Relation. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be with you today. I also want to express my gratitude to the organizers and hosts of this exciting event, and especially to Ella Fleming for all the work she's done to facilitate the conference. And finally, my thanks to the other speakers and to all of you for joining us. Efforts to wrest pre raphaelite women from the margins date back to at least the 1970s. 
Academic monographs and public-oriented exhibitions alike have laid claim to their artistic contributions as practitioners, not muses. Given the long-standing efforts to shift the conversation around these women, why does this cult of their beauty, which relegates them to aesthetic objects, persist? So efforts to wrest pre-Raphaelite women from the margins date back to at least the 1970s. Academic monographs and public-oriented exhibitions alike have laid claim to their artistic contributions as practitioners, not muses. Given the long-standing efforts to shift the conversation around these women, why does this cult of their beauty, which relegates them to aesthetic objects, persist? An answer, I suggest, lies in the ways that we have been thinking about relationality. To understand these women as artistic agents, we need to reevaluate our relationship with relationality. We must stop reinscribing these women as models and muses, telling their stories in service of advancing our knowledge about the men in their lives. At the same time, we can't simply elevate them as agents while stripping them of the contexts that shaped their lives and work. Ultimately, I argue that we need to develop a more complex idea of what constitutes a relational approach. That is, we need to situate these women within the broad array of networks in which they operated. We need to understand them as both influence, uh, we need to understand them as agents who both influenced and were influenced, who not only negotiated familial, social, and professional relationships, but broader socioeconomic conditions, and we need to understand the conditions that enabled or prevented their work from reaching us today. To that end, in my remarks, I'm going to think through what a relational framework for assessing the legacies of artistic women associated with the pre-Raphaelite network might look like. First, I'm going to work through the ways that a relational approach has been used with respect to these women. Then, drawing on the work of Jane Morris and Christina Rossetti, I will interrogate the extent to which their artistic output was circumscribed by their relationships with William Morris, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and William Michael Rossetti. Once we understand the networks in which these women were embedded um, we can, uh, and continue to shape their legacies today, we are in a better position to, to assess the advantages and limitations of a relational methodology. So what does it mean to be in relation, and how do we use relationality as an analytical approach? In its simplest formulation, the relational operates as a biographical shorthand. This person was born to these parents, married this person, had these children, etc. So far, so straightforward. We can then broaden our scope to consider that person's artistic influences or the professional networks in which they operated. Now, here's the clicker. Huzzah. In the case of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, its members explicitly invite this form of analysis. Even as they announce their rejection of artists from Raphael to Reynolds, they are in conversation with those same artists, as well as their medieval antecedents. More tellingly, for our purposes today, they bind themselves together in pursuit of their artistic ideals. The term brotherhood does a lot of this relational work. On the one hand, it evokes familial sociality, suggesting bonds of kinship that transcend aesthetic alignment. On the other, brotherhood produces an us versus them militancy, not brothers in arms, but brothers in arts. This in-group, out-group dynamic gets extended beyond the brotherhood itself to incorporate later artists, poets, and thinkers who shared aspects of the pre-Raphaelite vision. And I should say that this um, slide is in no way comprehensive. <laughs> In essence, we tend to think of the male pre-Raphaelites in the context of their professional and artistic networks, even as they use familial terms to describe those networks. To the extent that we think of the women artists associated with the pre-Raphaelite movement, we think about them in relation to the male artists who painted them. In other words, acknowledging their artistry flows from their status as models. Despite the problems evident in this formulation, elevating the professional status of, these women, of the women artists associated with the Brotherhood likewise carries risks. The terms sisters and pre-Raphaelite sisterhood often get used as a shorthand for the women who produced work in aesthetic sympathy with the Brotherhood and its followers. The term may have first gained traction with Jan Marsh's 1985 book, but a simple Google search reveals its present ubiquity for everything from intellectual debates to travel blogs. 
The term's use tends to evince an ethos of reclamation, that is, one that seeks to liberate these women from the masculinist narratives in which they are embedded and reveal their contributions to Victorian visual culture. Yet the bonds implied by pre-Raphaelite sisterhood are synthetic, not intrinsic, applied posthumously by later critics and historians. Sisterhood was not a name they chose for themselves, nor did they bind themselves together in pursuit of shared aims as the me members of the Brotherhood had done. Drawing these women together as sisters, in other words, creates stronger ties between them than they would have necessarily acknowledged. To be sure, there are documented friendships among some of these women, as we've heard, um, and also uh, such as Jane Morris's friendships with uh, the wives and sisters of her husbands, such as Georgiana Byrne Jones and Mary de Morgan. These friendships yielded collaborative projects, much like those of their male relations, uh, such as Jane Morris and Mary de Morgan's work on the embroidered coverlet for William Morris's bed, now on display at Kelmscott Manor. Even as the term sisterhood draws attention to some meaningful connections among these women, it simultaneously elides critical distinctions between them. What, for example, unites Christina Rossetti, who often gets included as a pre-Raphaelite sister, despite some crucial differences with either Elizabeth Siddle or Jade Morris beyond their shared ties with Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Insofar as there were bonds among the women affiliated with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and its circle, those relationships were often mediated by the men in their lives. With my remaining time, I think it would be helpful to look at some examples of the ways in which our understanding of the women in the Pre-Raphaelite orbit is inextricable from their associations with those men. Because I'm a literary scholar and book historian, I'm going to draw on some examples from those fields. First, let's look at how Jane Morris's artistic legacy has been shaped with her relationships with William Morris and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. She is perhaps the most overdetermined figure among the women who modeled for the pre-Raphaelite painters, the face that launched a thousand exhibitions of pre-Raphaelite art. Here are a few examples. Um, here we are today. <laughs> Jane Morris's features, which we see through Dante Gabriel Rossetti's eyes, act as a proxy for the entirety of the pre-Raphaelite aesthetic enterprise. Her ubiquity parallels the ubiquity of her husband's designs. One, a collectible commodity with currency in the contemporary marketplace. The other, an instantly recognizable cipher used to sell exhibition tickets. Biographies by Wendy Parkins and Suzanne Fajance Cooper have sought to enflesh the two-dimensional figure of Rossetti's paintings. Offering new insights into Jane Morris's work, Parkins and Fajance Cooper reveal the extent to which attribution prevents a more thorough accounting of Jane Morris's creative output. In other words, it can be challenging to identify Jane Morris's work for the firm because that work was largely uncredited, subsumed within the efforts of the larger working community. Moreover, Jane Morris's creative contributions tended to take the form of domestic handicrafts, such as embroidery and needlework. And you've already heard about Talia Schaefer's work today, but domestic handicraft, uh, according to her work, domestic handicraft offered a measure of financial independence to craftswomen earlier in the 19th century, but, quote, the arts and crafts movement violently repudiated ornamental arts and passionately adhered to pre-industrial principles making itself a compelling story of a sudden artistic renaissance in which a few committed men of genius rediscover the long-lost, glorious craft history of England. Jane Morris, in other words, was producing traditional women's work in a context where that work was in the process of being regendered and monetized in new ways. To take a particular example of how the problem of attribution operates, Let's look at a late 13th century Bible owned by William Morris that is now in the collections of the Society of Antiquaries of London. For a sense of scale, that's my ring in the lower left-hand corner. The Bible is richly illuminated, and per the catalog notes, it features embroidered, uh, elaborate embroidered men's date uncertain to tears at the top and side edges of many leaves, mostly in red and blue flossed silk. You can see some examples of the men's on the right. Now, while the catalog lists the date of this mending work as uncertain, a curator suggested to me that the embroidery was probably Victorian. And without more robust scientific analysis, 
I think there's a reasonable case to be made for that dating, given the ways in which it conforms to Victorian color theory and the embroiderer's sensitivity to the medieval illuminations. In the event that this mending work was executed after the book's acquisition by William Morris, and I will say, granted, that's a big if. It's equally possible that William or Jane did that embroidery. However, Jane Morris's name appears nowhere in the archival record. Any work that she may have done has been subsumed by her husband's ownership of the book. In other words, a relational approach that considers Jane Morris's work alongside that of her husband helps us expand our understanding of that work while bringing the problems of attribution into sharper focus. This example also stages issues around material loss and archival lacunae that I don't have time to go into right now, but I'd be happy to discuss during the Q&A. Now let's turn to Christina Rossetti. If Jane Morris's associations with Dante Gabriel Rossetti and William Morris prevented a more thorough accounting of her work and continue to stymie efforts to identify her creative endeavors, Christina Rossetti's canonization among Victorian poets was enabled by her brother, William Michael Rossetti. Certainly, Christina Rossetti modeled for her brother, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and as Jan Marsh notes, he was a strong advocate for her work during his life. But Gabriel's death preceded Christina's by more than 12 years, and William outlived Christina by nearly 25 years. In that time, he produced numerous works that contributed to the hagiography of his family, including a posthumous collection of Christina's poems, collected works of both Christina and Gabriel, family letters, diaries, and his own reminiscences. As we'll see in a moment, he also had the right to authorize publication of her personal writings. In his own words, from an undated letter to the novelist Anna Steele, I am working at something, may say that I am always doing that. While William Rossetti's role as his family's mythographer is often taken as a given, the depth of his commitment to acting as the caretaker for his family's legacy has yet to be fully explored. In the work I've been doing this summer at the John Rylands Research Institute, I've been looking at their collections of William Rossetti's correspondence, and today I want to share with you two examples of his work uh, towards Christina's legacy, one from his personal correspondence and one from his professional correspondence. With respect to the former, in an 1895 letter, to, again to Anna Steele, so, and that's between Christina's death in 1894 and the 1896 publication of new poems by Christina Rossetti, hitherto unpublished or uncollected, which William Rossetti edited. He discusses some of the poems that will appear in that edition. A triad is certainly among C's best. Of passing away, he writes, to me, a wonderful thing certainly not surpassed by anything that C ever wrote. Of the round tower at Jancy, he aligns his sister's poetic talent with that of Shakespeare, observing, I question whether Shakespeare himself could have divined better than Christina the exact emotional mood proper to the subject and its treatment. Elsewhere in the letter, he claims to be unbiased. And while I think we can take that claim with a grain of salt, the fact that he is so generous with his praise and his personal correspondence reveals his marked appreciation for his sister's writing and attention to the way her work was received. In his professional correspondence, by contrast, William Rossetti verges on aggression when publishers subvert his preferences with respect to the treatment of his siblings. In an 1899 letter to his literary agent, he writes, I return the draft agreement. I do not assent to the proposal that executors, administrators, or assins of Mackenzie Bell should have the right of dealing with those letters. That's 18 of Christina's letters. They would be persons of whom I do and can know nothing, and I might play ducks and drakes with the letters. Given William Rossetti's careful curation of Christina's poetic legacy over nearly 25 years, we have to ask whether the poet we know today is a product of her brother's mediation. I should add that this consideration should in no way take away from Christina Rossetti's accomplishments as a poet. Rather, a relational approach helps us understand and acknowledge the contributions that enable certain forms of reception. These two examples reveal the complexities embedded in the relational approach I have been sketching out today. In the case of Jane Morris, a relational approach reveals the mechanisms whereby the networks in which she operated 
confound efforts to appraise her work. In the case of Christina Rossetti, a relational approach exposes the benefits that male advocacy could confer. In other words, relationality is neither a one-size-fits-all solution, nor is it a barrier that must be overcome. Rather, it is an approach that insists on context and accounts for the lived experiences of these women. It acknowledges that these women come to us already mediated and sheds light on those mediations. It's also an approach that invites interdisciplinarity and collaboration. The networks in which these women operated are sufficiently complex that we would benefit from opportunities to think together across disciplinary boundaries, art history, women's studies, literature, and on. In short, a relational approach should bring us in relation to each other as scholars to understand the material conditions that shaped the lives of these women and continue to shape their afterlives. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you to our three speakers. Uh, for really rich papers, and I feel, Jennifer, your, your final words are sort of ringing in my ears as a sort of clarion call, really, for the kind of work that I think the conference is doing uh, for thinking about relationality sort of beyond biography and thinking about the complexities of the kinds of work and then the kinds of methods, the methodologies it sort of us as to think about and and uh, think about using and I was it's interesting I was thinking as a speaker coming from um, these topics from different disciplinary backgrounds as well and and I think that's really useful for us to have those perspectives um, as well but I was really struck um, of an idea that I think you all presented through the papers about the material forms of relationship I was thinking particularly about drawing in, in your paper, Glenda, that sort of sparks that um, idea for me and thinking about the particularities of drawing, drawing friends or drawing family and, and how in the very delicate lines as a, the tenderness and the intimacy, so whether there's something particular about um, the materialities and textures where we can think about relationality and relationships in, in quite specific ways through different forms of making. So I had drawing in my head as you were talking. And then I think, um, Wendy, as you, you were um, speaking as well, I was thinking about collaborative acts of making as well and, the, and what that evokes when you're bringing people with different kinds of skill together and whether that's metal work and painting and, and again um, the embroidery that you showed as well um, really got me thinking about surface and texture and touch as well that actually uh, in a lot of we're not just it's not just the visual that's evoked but these are gifts that are to be either worn or so, so they have a bodily relationship mm -hmm. as well. And then, and Jennifer as well, the, the art of the book, when you made the point that you are a, a literary scholar and a book historian, I was thinking of all the kind of the dust and the accumulation of life, which is, is um, captured in the crevices of those books, especially if they've been embroidered and painted and, and made. So I just wondered whether that you had thoughts about the particularities of, of materials and um and particular forms of art making that could speak to this theme of relationality i don't know what that jennifer you're, I, you're looking I, you're I, nodding I, at I'm me sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um so the, the way i would approach that question um really comes down to the the affective experience as a researcher encountering those materials in the archive yeah. that um you know, I don't know if anybody noticed this because the images went by fairly quickly, but Rossetti's hand is, in, uh, sorry, William Michael Rossetti's hand is intentionally um, archaic. Like he uses long S's, which is not like, by the, by the fact, like this is 1909 or something. <laughs> you know, by that point, this is so far in the, the rear view mirror that, um, the notion that he's, he's using these archaic forms is something you have to get used to as you're reading it. And so you get these sort of moments where you're, you're stumbling, but then you, you, it becomes easier and you start to recognize things. And you find things like, you know, 
a tea stain from the cup on the letter, which I have a delightful photo of, or the fact that he writes about his cats a lot, and the sort of um, the femininity and maternal nature of cats, like you know, and, and so these moments I think mm. sort of bring forward the the experience of the material for the researcher. I think um, where I, my starting point for this paper was to um, be really uh, honest with myself about my own frustration at the total contradiction between the materiality of these things and trying to get to the bottom of what they mean, who made them, whose hands had been on them. And I think it's that the materiality and the tactility mm. um, and that you know, um, many of us here would have seen all of those objects many times in person or in image. And, and I sort of sat down thinking, there's still so much about, I've seen these images, I've seen these objects, I still feel like I don't know anything about them. Like who, who touched them, what did they mean to them, who worked on them, you know, what's the gap between the intention and the end product. All of those things, there's that frustration about, yeah, that absolute, um, you know, that limit between the very matter-of-fact materiality of the object and, and what we know about it. And um, I remember thinking about, you know, somewhere like Red House, um, when you read the descriptions of, of the, the work in progress on that and thinking, that house must have always smelt of wet paint. You know, it must have <laughs> always been work going on there and that was part of it. But you go there now, and this goes back to the previous session, where, mm. yes, it still feels like a house, like I could move in tomorrow and live in it very happily. But it, it, it does have that museum feel as well. Mm. So it, you, know, you can't smell the wet paint anymore. It's just that irreducible otherness of, um, of the past that is never quite available to us. Do you have any yeah, um, well, I started out um, taking just the title Rossetti's in Relation, and I thought, well, if we're looking at relationships, what about the relationship between the three people? Um, and there is so little that remains of anything um, from Elizabeth mm. that we just have to look beyond the correspondence um, into things like the poetry and the art to find how they got on, if they did, um, and perhaps read things differently to what they've always been read. Um, everything that we do is subjective. When we're looking at art or poetry, we come away with a different interpretation to other people. And I just sort of took the bull by the horns and went down a completely different route. Great, thank you. Well, I'm sure there's, I can already see responses. There's one here, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Look. Um, mm -hmm. I, I try again. Two, three. Testing. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, thank you very much. I have a question for Wendy. Um, I'm just wondering if you could say a bit more about time and temporality in relation to this. I mean, you were starting to touch on that when you talked about the, you know, the irretrievability of the past, mm. uh, the pain smell of paint in Red House, mm. which is gone forever. Mm. And um, if these objects, you know, to imbue self in these objects and give to another is also a gift of time, as you said, mm. the work that's been put into it mm. and care. And then it requires attention from the other <coughs> in a reciprocal relationship. Um, and also, but then what is it to us, you know, uh, coming at it? Um, in the archive or mm. actually um, in person, are these more than relics of um, a self imbued and time imbued? Mm. How do you open that up? Have you thought about that? So a general question, part time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great question. I think you've sort of, you'd be, you're, you're answering it there in, in ways that I'd like to hear more about from you. Um, but I think a good example of that is the keepsake books of Jane Morris, which have been in the past have been sort of dismissed as amateur efforts and um, uh, it was really, I mean, I 
I don't have photographs of the ones in the, the British Library which are much more sophisticated than that first one. And we have that one because it's still held at Castle Howard. Um, but So I think in the past, if people have noticed them, they described them as quite amateur and seen them purely as that sense of a keepsake passed from friend to friend. Um, although we're still unclear quite who the, the three books in um, the British Library were made for. Um, but there is work now, and I think it's um, Joanna Amos has written a brilliant article about the keepsake books. Um, and taking them more seriously um, as artistic objects in which it's obvious that time has been lavished. And in, but even, even in, in that case, we don't know what the destination was of those, of those books, not, not with certainty. So when you handle things like that, you have this, this goes back to what you were saying about the affect of the researcher. Mm. You have this sense of the time, the detail, and the sort of the fineness of the work. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done on um, helping us unpack that, that more. And so, yes, I, I don't really have anything more. Yeah. More to un unpack if ever, <laughs> as you did. I did. I saw some hands waving at me from, from the back, I think. Okay, so <laughs> Ella, I'll let you <laughs> sort that out up there. <laughs> we take the first question. Hi, um, just a response to Wendy. I'm uh, talking about the other keepsake books. I'm going to be talking about Jane Morris's the photographs um, and the Parsons photographs in the private view later. And I will have some images of the other keepsake books there to share with people because. Um, yeah, they are. They do add to this uh, this conversation about what she was reading, who she was in relation with, uh, sort of intellectually as well as personally. So, um, I think we, there are some five-minute talks uh, during the private view, and I'll be dealing with that. That's okay, a, thanks. Thank you. That's a very good plug for all the treats that are to, <laughs> yet to come. Um, yeah, can we take another question whilst the mics at the back of the room? Thank you. I was just wondering if. Oh, if he had a relationship with his mother or if his mother was around, because he, he seems to have a very respectful and un, it, his, his approach to his women that uh, kind of un sexualized. I <laughs> he wants to. <laughs> he wants to. <laughs> um, yeah, Gabriel's mother yeah. was definitely around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The family respected her greatly. His father died um, quite early. So the girls looked after his father for some time. Um, Maria took over most of it and then Christina. Um, but mum was around for a long time and he wrote a lot of letters to his mother. So that's where we get quite a lot of the information from is in the family letters. William Michael first published them, um, but then Friedemann has done all the correspondence mm. in nine volumes plus the appendix so that you can actually look up letters to his mother um, etc and find out more about the relationship mm. good luck with your ma um, <laughs> and i think the, the family mythographers and the family historians um, <laughs> aspect of this is really fascinating um, okay uh, right right let me uh, i think someone's yeah, got I, I'm a mic. holder of the microphone and then we'll take a question down at the front just to make it fair uh, this uh, a question for jennifer i really enjoyed your defense of relationality but i wonder whether it might be possible to keep the term sisterhood for other reasons i ask as an old person <laughs> not turning 70 old person who grew up uh in and with second wave feminism and who remembers that it's not an accident that um, people started talking in the 70s about the pre-Raphaelite sisterhood, because sisterhood was a political term. It was associated with Robin Morgan, with the idea of sisterhood is powerful, sisterhood is global, and to keep it is to emphasize an aspect we haven't talked about much yet, which is the political possibility of the pre-Raphaelite women, the way in which um, those who were recovering them, using the term sisterhood, were emphasizing 
emphasizing how they were breaking gender norms, how they were breaking class norms by being artists and writers. And that word sisterhood helps us to focus on that political challenge. So maybe a reason to keep it with relationality. I, th I think that's a fair point. Um, I think it's part of the reception history of the women, and I think there's value in that. But I was, oops, I keep forgetting there's a microphone here. Um, I would say that as I see it, it's, it's doing some forms of, I'm not sure whether I want to say it's forms of erasure or forms of um, elision that I, I, I worry about. Um, so I take your point. I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's useful and it is an important part of the sort of the long history of reception that um, I was gesturing towards in my talk. So. There was a question down here at the front. No, I was glad somebody brought up the, um, the Rossetti's mother, who's a really, really important figure. And there, um, I'm just wondering whether you know our notions of relationality can actually um, expand way, way beyond what we uh, we do have a tendency to sort of get caught in a rather small circle of of, of Rossetti's. I mean, I was also <laughs> thinking about. Um, Walter Howard Deverell's mother, who turned, who played an important role in, and there, there's some, um, there's all kinds of other people, and something like that volume of the, the, the huge volume of all Rossetti's correspondence shows how much larger these circles were than, the, and 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 where there's um, these. Uh, all kinds of links and connections that that um, and so you know in a certain sense we we have a tendency to perpetuate the the, the smaller tight circles of pre-Raphaelites that 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 perhaps are the, the the Rossetti family letters model might sort of um, indicate and there there are also all kinds of other uh, characters who don't tend to get remember terribly often all the servants. Rossetti servants were always quitting, which, with which <laughs> one has a great deal of sympathy. But they're, um, they're actually important members of uh, the, this sort of um, much wider circle. Not, and of course, pets, animals. There's all kinds of other relationships that we could start to capture well, in our the, the, expanded the, the dove, so. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The I'll bat. take a few more. There's a question there at the back. We've probably got a few more minutes because we're running a little bit over time. Um, and I know we have to vacate this room, but we'll try and squeeze in another few. Right the There's one at the back there. Someone's got their hand right out waving. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Um, I think they, the, the three papers said some really interesting things to each other. Um, and I want to especially just say thank you to Jennifer um, for critiquing the term sisterhood. I'm, I sort of brought, I think I brought this up at the pre raphaelite Sisters conference as well, that this is a term that creates relations where maybe there aren't any and that it just needs to be questioned in that way. But thinking along those lines, I have a question for Glenda. Um, in that, you know, Elizabeth and Christina don't seem to be friendly. They don't seem to be sisterly for a very long period of time. Um, and you also demonstrate, you talk about the fact that there's not much of Elizabeth's material. And I'm wondering if you could say something about what kind of critical approaches or theoretical approaches you're using to frame that relationship. I'm thinking particularly of something like, um, Sharon Marcus's work between women, what kind of critical feminist theory you're using to construct that relationship out of these absences, not just reading the poems and the artworks, but what sort of thought process is happening to construct that relationship? Nothing particularly theoretical. I was just interested in why there was no sort of real relationship between them. Everything that you read seems to say, that uh, it was cold, it was frosty, and there's just absolutely nothing to go on without reading biographically into the poetry, the artworks that are done, etc. There's, there's just absolutely nothing. I'm hoping that perhaps this and uh, anything that I've written about it will bring people to look more closely. Maybe we can find some 
some work that we don't know exists. Maybe there is something out there somewhere that we can find a bit more about how Elizabeth and Christina did interact. I'm going to say, there's a, I saw that hand there, and then we've got one there, and then I think we will have to continue questions over a drink. There's um, right at the back some... Um, sorry, again, it's hard to see from the stage, but um, if we take the... Yeah, that's it. You just keep waving and the microphone will come to you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentations, which... Well, I'm, I'm totally ignorant of this subject, quite honestly, but extremely positive, extremely moving, very affectionate indeed. But, I mean, I wonder whether this was, to some degree, designed for public consumption in a positive way, even by art historians today. Because it seems to be, although you mentioned competitiveness, you didn't mention jealousies, antipathies, which often occur within families to a dreadful extent sometimes. Was there none of this? Or am I might getting the wrong impression? Yeah, Glenda, you I were talking about that. I definitely mentioned you? jealousies and rivalries and, and things that like that. wonderful uh, Christina yeah. in, a, in a rage. I'm going to remember that uh, image. <laughs> um, thank you. And well, intimacies and uh, consumption, I think it's a really good point. We can, and then we'll, we'll say... Sorry, oh yeah. Sorry, I'll just try and take, take this uh, question. This lady's been waiting patiently with Hello, the microphone. Sorry. Um, I have another question about materiality and art um, for anyone to answer. Uh, I, one of the things that struck me when I went to the exhibition was just the fact that Elizabeth Siddle's art is made with cheaper materials um, than Dante Gabriel Rossetti's art. And it, obviously, the, the the kind of line can be drawn between the fact that she was a working class woman in various precarious circumstances and Rossetti wasn't. And I just wonder if anyone knows if that was a kind of choice or, like, you know, in terms of her kind of, uh, like an artistic choice or whether it was a result of her circumstances. Well, she used mostly uh, Gabriel's materials anyway because she worked in his studio. She didn't have much of her own. So anything that she used was in his studio. Um, she was targeting the book illustration industry. So her, her, instead of her drawings being small because she was a woman, etc., they were small because she was actually targeting the size needed for reproduction in books. Books of poetry, for example, were sort of like about six inches by four inches. Um, and the illustrations would go as the title page, like Prince's Progress, etc. Um, so they'd have an illustration and perhaps a little tiny illustration at the top where the first verse of the poem came. Um, that's what she was targeting. So... I guess. Sorry? It's a really important context. It's it is, yeah. Overlooked. Great. Well, I can see there's more hands up, more questions bubbling. I'm really glad we've got tomorrow as well <laughs> to kind of keep um, this energy uh, running through. But we've also got fantastic things to come tonight. We've got um, a drinks reception in the Grand Saloon, and I think we're going to be escorted into that um, area because it's a sort of a little bit behind the scenes added bonus. <laughs> and then we'll also have the private view of the exhibition where we'll have some more talks and we'll be um, free to kind of uh, look at the exhibition together to continue these conversations. And also here, um, we have six um, talks this evening as well. So much more food for thought. But I want us to thank our speakers uh, for their generosity and sharing all that archive work as well. I was really struck by that, which was um, really amazing. You saw, we saw your photographs and images and the sort of the labors of your own as you've done all that work. So please join with me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.